Oh, hey, hello, good afternoon. Right, stop. So, let's stop. Uh -huh. So, um, I've talked a few times about um, the revenge of functionalism or the revenge of physicalism. And um, what I mean is we've looked at all these arguments that try to show that there is more to the mind, there's more to the subjective life than physicalism explains. And uh, the revenge of the scientific approach to the mind is to say, well, if there is anything we're missing out, it's something that doesn't matter. It's something that makes no difference to what goes on. And there's a line of argument for epiphenomenalism. I'll say quite a bit more in a second about what that is that really writes up that revenge <coughs> large. And so today we're looking at Huxley's article on the hypothesis that animals are automata and its history. Um, for uh, next week, there isn't any specific reading. Next week is meant as a review week. So um, I'll go, what I'll try and do in lectures next week is give um, a quite different angle on the topics we've been looking at. Um, but it, uh, it's meant from the point of view of reading to give you a chance to catch your breath. We'll give out essay topics for the next essay on Tuesday. Um, that will be due sometime in, it says in early November. I can't remember the exact date. Um, early November is when the next essay is due. So you will have plenty of time, I hope. And um, uh, in between uh, now and the start of November, we'll be doing a whole block on personal identity, which is a fresh start. Well, this, is a, this is a different part of the forest that we'll be looking at. So we're really waving goodbye to many of the subjects we've looked at already when we take up with personal identity. Um, uh, and so the, the, read, the next reading will be Locks of Identity and Diversity, which is in the Perry Collection, the small blue book. Um, Austin Jackson, do you want to comment on the essays? Is oh, yeah. Um, so I will return essays to my students this afternoon, probably in an hour or two after uh, uh, the lecture. Uh, yep, so look out for that. Okay. I talked about the uh, Okay, great. Okay. Okay, any questions? Just about where we are and where we're going. Okay, um, onwards. Um, so today I want to start out with by looking at what functionalism is and Huxley's frog, what, what epiphenomenalism is and Huxley's frog argument for epiphenomenalism. Then we'll look at more recent developments. So we've had this before, I think. This is the basic epiphenomenalist picture. Um, this up here at the top, the monkey holding the wheel, this is you in your subjective life um, holding a wheel that isn't connected to anything, facing in the wrong direction, shouting, I'm in charge. I'm making all this happen. This, the tiger here, is the biology of the human that is uh, driving you onwards, um, whether you like it or not. The conscious life is there. It's not that we're saying there is no conscious life here, but it just isn't connected to anything. It isn't in charge of anything, although it has this persistent illusion that it is in charge of what's going on. There is this illusion of freedom, that we are in charge of what we decide to do. Even if, and even for very simple things like, will I move my hand to the right or to the left? The epiphenomenalist is saying, that's just a mistake. You and your subjective life are not what's in charge here. So Huxley sets out the basic case here. And he starts out um, uh, by making a basic point about humans and animals that even without the benefit of consciousness, um, humans and animals are both capable of actions that are complex, coordinated, and purposive. Right? So you can have very complex action in the absence of consciousness, and that can be demonstrated. That's Huxley's basic point. Um, Descartes had said animals don't have consciousness at all. Descartes thought that animals were literally 
thoughtless brutes. They didn't have feeling or sensation. So Descartes would have had no qualms about animal experimentation. That is just fine. There is no feeling or sensation here. You can do what you like to them, just as you can mess about with any piece of clockwork to do what you like with. Um, Huxley says, that's not right. Animals surely are conscious. Many animals surely are conscious. But Descartes was right about in saying that the consciousness that animals have does no work in generating their actions. Okay, so that's the abstract structure of the epiphenomenalist picture. Huxley says, though we may see reason to disagree with Descartes' hypothesis that brutes are unconscious machines, it does not follow that he was wrong in regarding them as automata. So the animal is basically a piece of clockwork. It is basically a piece of biological engineering. Um, it has a mind associated with it, but the mind does no work in generating its actions. The mind does no work in, in making a difference to the behavior of the animal. The consciousness of brutes would appear to be related to the mechanism of their body simply as a collateral product of its working simply as a collateral product of the body working. So the consciousness of brutes is as completely without any power of modifying that working as the steam which, will, which, which accompanies the work of the locomotive engine is without influence on its machinery. So if you think of the lonesome whistle of the train going through the night, then um, here you have all this powerful machinery. The whistle is just a bit of steam given off by the working of the machinery. The whistle itself is not a functioning part of the um, cogs and pistons that are making the thing go. That's your mind, the steam blast given off by the body when it's going full throttle. The lonesome whistle of your body motoring through the night. That's all consciousness is, a kind of exhalation of the machinery. The volition of animals, if they have any, is an emotion indicative of physical changes. It's not a cause of such changes. The soul stands related to the body as the bell of a clock to the works. So there's a clockwork inside the tower making the hands go round. The soul is like the bell is not part of the working machinery. The bell itself is not part of what's dictating where the hands are and where, where the movement is. The soul is like the bell, um, a mere appendage of all the working physical machinery. And consciousness is the analog of the sound which the bell gives out when it's struck. And Huxley has an argument that frogs in particular are like that. So this is one of these cases where as with the bat, I mean, I would love to have been able to introduce a bat into the room so you could see what Nagel meant. Um, it'd be nice to actually have a frog, but meantime, we just have to look at pictures of the frog. So Huxley's point was back when he was writing, it was known that if you cut, if, if the spinal cord of a human is cut, then there's no consciousness of what's controlled below the cut in the spinal cord, right? You're not going to have any feeling in your body below the point at which the spinal cord's been cut. Um, still, there can be um, behavior, uh, be in complex behavior in that numbed part of the body. And he says, if that works for humans, it should work for frogs. Suppose you can, I mean, we, but we feel freer to experiment with making incisions in the spinal cords of frogs than we do with making incisions in the spinal cords of humans. So if the spinal cord of a frog is cut across so as to provide us with a segment separated from the brain, so what's going on below the cut is separated from the brain, then you will have a subject, a frog subject, parallel to the injured man on which experiments 
can be performed without remorse. <laughs> There's something delicious about that. <laughs> anyway, as we have a right to conclude that a frog's spinal cord is not likely to be conscious when a man's is not. So if a human doesn't have any consciousness below the incision in the spinal cord, it's hardly likely that there will be enough complexity in the spinal cord um, below the incision in the frog to sustain consciousness. So if a man's spinal cord is divided, the part of the central nervous system which lies beyond the injury is cut off from consciousness. So similarly, you cut off the frog's spinal cord, but then you find that the frog can perform quite complex behaviors. If you pour without remorse, as Huxley would say, folic acid onto one of the frog's feet, the other one will rub and try to get the folic acid off. A frog with the foremost two-thirds of its brain removed will still swim when you put it into water. So that complex swimming movement is being coordinated without the benefit of consciousness. A frog, if you remove um, the anterior division, the, the, with the, this is just a huge chunk of the frog's brain. If you remove so much of the frog's brain as lies in front of the optic lobe, you've got this <laughs> hapless frog with its um, brain mostly removed placed on your hand. Okay, picture, if you will, this hapless frog on the hand. And suppose the hand be very gently inclined so that the frog would naturally tend to slip off. The creature's forepaws are shifted onto the edge of the hand until he can just prevent himself from falling. And if the turning of the hand is continued, he goes through the needful set of muscular operations until he comes to be seated in security on the back of the hand. The doing of all this requires a delicacy of coordination and a precision of adjustment of the muscular apparatus of the body, which are only comparable to those of a rope dancer. It may be assumed, then, that molecular changes in the brain are the causes of all the states of consciousness of brutes. And presumably, everything that's going on in the consciousness of an animal is a product of its biology. But is there any evidence that those states of consciousness are causing the molecular changes that give rise to muscular motion? Suppose animals do feel. Suppose animals do have sensation. Is there any evidence that that sensation is controlling their movements? Huxley says, I see no such evidence. If the frog walks, walks, <coughs> hops, swims, and goes through his gymnastic performances quite as well without consciousness and consequently without volition, it doesn't make any difference to the complexity of the behavior that the frog's capable of. This is goal-directed behavior that it's exhibiting on the base without consciousness. Um, nonetheless, Huxley says, the frog is free. The frog is not constrained. If you think, well, I'm a free agent. I'm a free person. Well, Huxley says, you're free in the sense that the frog is free. The sense is, there's nothing preventing you doing what you want to do. I mean, the frog has no obstacles preventing it from doing what it wants. It is true, though, that what it wants, the subjective life of the frog up here on the back of the tiger, is making no difference to what happens. But nonetheless, Huxley has given you this consolation. There, are actually, there may actually be no external impediments. It's not as if you're in jail. It's not as if you're bound and gagged. There's no impediment to you doing what you want. It's just that what you want is not making any difference to anything that happens. But Huxley's saying, that's all you require for freedom. OK, so that's epiphenomenalism and Huxley's basic case for being an epiphenomenalist about animals.
Um, did you have a question? Oh, uh, yes? Um, when your spine is broken and you can't move your limbs below that uh, elbow crest, do you, um, do you actually feel anything? Like if somebody touches you? <coughs> that, that's wrong the wrong way. What, what Huxley is saying is when the cord is severed, you can't, that's the datum, you can't feel anything below that. But there will nonetheless be complex coordinated purposive behavior without the benefit of consciousness. So that you see what you I mean? Can't, you can't feel it and you can't move it consciously, so then, like, if the That's right. touches you, you won't feel it. Yeah. You will rub the folic acid off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> okay, is that plain enough? Plain as day? Okay. So what about humans? How does it go for humans? How does it go for you and me? Is that, yeah? Well, because I thought that if you're severed, if your uh, spinal cord was severed, then, like, you were, like, a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, and you couldn't, you couldn't move anything as well as not being able to feel it, but obviously it's not. That's not what Huxley is saying. I don't, I, I, mean, I haven't tried it myself, so I, I, I don't actually know wh what kind of damage is, is actually being suffered by um, a quadriplegic or paraplegic. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, but um, I'll show you in a way, in, in a moment, that you can get the same effect as Huxley, that Huxley is talking about with human experimentation without having to do this uh, uh, as a tryout, if you see what I mean. So like yeah. if, I, if I was interpreting the meeting correctly, um, the, the osteoarthritis can't, can't feel anything below your the, the incision, yeah. yeah. And they can't move it voluntarily. And if you were to like tickle the bottom of the foot, the foot would move. Right. Th th that's exactly right. The the the, 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 the one light, well, the one foot will rob the folic acid mm -hmm. off. Yeah. But w the datum that Huxley needs is that there is no consciousness below the cut. Right. Yeah. Though, as you say, there can be complex, coordinated, purposive behavior. It has an objective. This behavior. Like the frog or, or, or whatever. I, I was once talking about this to a physiologist, and um, he said to me cheerfully, If we put you on a treadmill and set you walking, and we cut your head off, you will continue walking just fine. Um, it really wouldn't be a problem. Um, I, d <laughs> I don't know quite why he was so authoritative about this. They kind of done it very often. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> but um, this is a very distinguished guy. I'm sure it's true that the, the control of your coordination as you're walking is not being done by the brain. It's distributed through the body, the control. Um, well, you might say that's all right for rubbing acid off one foot with another. But what about things that seem more likely to be under conscious control? Like if I think, I'm going to pick up that bit of paper. Could I do that in the absence of consciousness? I mean, surely, um, if you take things like reaching to something you can see, picking up the cup, um, catching a ball, don't you need consciousness for that? Isn't your conscious life what makes all that go? Well, the thing about that is we already talked about blind sight. Blind sight being this condition where um, Actually, Jackson talked about this too, right? You, you get, a, you get a, um, a damage to your visual cortex, to one half of your visual cortex, and uh, uh, you don't have any visual experience of what's going on in the blind field. But patients who don't have any visual experience of what's going on in the blind field, if you say, reach out and pick up the thing in your blind field, they can do that. They can do that just fine, to their own surprise. Um, if you give them a particular shape to pick up, they will at first say, well, how can I pick it up? I can't see a thing over there. But they will reach and pick it up with their hand shaped just right to, to uh, fit the shape of the object they're picking up. Um, that's possible without consciousness. There's um, a condition, motion blindness, where people can't see motion. So... The world seems frozen. If you're watching water being cold, poured from a kettle, it will seem like there's just a frozen stream of water there, and then suddenly it's stopped. 
you know, the scene has moved on. You're kind of getting a strobe effect on ordinary vision, where you're getting long freeze frames, um, and then things suddenly change. So you can't visually experience motion. I mean, so someone like this is in very bad shape, right? I mean, you can't drive, for example, right? You, you don't have that continuous experience of mo movement. Um, Peter McLeod, uh, um, an experimental psychologist in Oxford, had um, one patient, um, a keen cricket player, had one motion blind player, one motion blind um, subject sitting in his lab. He had a cricket ball and he just tossed it to her uh, uh, spontaneously in the course of the uh, interview and she just reached out and caught it. So you think about something like reaching for a cricket ball, you might think, Look, of course you've got to have conscious experience. That's why, that's the part of the... That's part of the point of having conscious experience, that it lets you reach out and grab things, pick things up. But what you find is that, and, and this is a lesson of uh, experimental psychology over and over again, that when it goes, that conscious experience, it's perfectly possible for the behavioral abilities to stay intact. Yeah. So consciousness is not doing the work it seemed to do. And really, the thunderbolt finding uh, on this kind of thing came from Libet, um, an experimental psychologist working in the 1990s. Um, he, the basic finding <coughs> is motor readiness potentials in the brain um, come before your awareness of your intention to act. So in general, when you make a movement, it's not a conscious decision that is causing it. So I th here's Libet's basic setup. Um, did we talk about this before? This hasn't come up before. Okay. This is so basic to so, so much work now. Um, but the basic setup back then was um, you have the subject um, holding um, a, a, a clicker, and the subject's got, um, got um, uh, EEG apparatus monitoring uh, signals from the premotor cortex. So it can tell uh, when cells in the premotor cortex are starting to fire. Now, follow me very closely here. This is a little bit subtle, but when you think about what he's saying, it is really a bombshell. Um, the subject's watching the hand in a clock sweeping round and round. And the subject's told, sometime in the next couple of minutes, here's your task, sometime in the next couple of minutes, do this. Just push the clicker when you like. At, uh, uh, at your whim, push the clicker. And all we ask that you do is notice where the hand in the clock is when you push the clicker, when you make that conscious decision. So not actually when you push it, but when you make the conscious decision to push the clicker. So does that make sense? Yep. That's your task. Push the clicker, but we'll be watching the clock. So when you've decided, I'm going to do it now, note when you made that conscious decision. Meanwhile, the cells in the premotor cortex <coughs> are being monitored. And the basic finding is that um, the firing up of the cells in the premotor cortex to um, mobilize the action. That was happening hundreds of milliseconds before the conscious decision to push the clicker. So what's happening is your brain is firing up, saying, do it now. Your brain's saying that. You have conscious awareness of the decision. I'm going to do it now a little bit later. Yeah? So your conscious decision was not the source of the, of the movement. The source of the movement was the firing up of the cells in the premotor cortex. That came first. So it looks like the picture is something like this. There are these cell firings that cause the action. These are what the EEG is monitoring. They are causing the action. Your conscious intention is coming hundreds of milliseconds later. Your conscious decision happens later. So right now, if you put up your hand, if you wave, you can try this right now. <laughs> what is going on is that the cell firings are causing the waving. Your conscious decision is not what made it happen. Now, 
Libet's finding um, caused a lot of follow-ups. And um, in 2008, um, there was a paper published showing this. So th um, Libet's finding was about um, uh, hundreds of milliseconds. Um, uh, th these guys were doing a different task. They were saying, don't just push a clicker. Push this lever to the left or the right. Okay, Whatever you like, do it um, at whim, left or right. Um, and just let us know when you made the conscious decision. I'm going to push it to the left or I'm going to push it to the right. So at the back of the room, there are the guys monitoring your brain. Um, and then you're thinking, well, which, what shall I do? It all lies before me. Shall I push it to the left or to the right? Everything's to play for. What do I care? Right? That's your frame of mind. The guys at the back of the room are monitoring your brain. Two specific regions in the frontal and parietal cortex of the human brain had considerable information that predicted the outcome of a motor decision the subjects had not yet consciously made. It suggests that when the subject's decision reached awareness, it had um, been influenced by unconscious brain activity for up to 10 seconds. So what's going on is, you're saying, what shall I do, to the left or to the right? The guys at the back of the room reading the EEG know 10 seconds before you make that conscious decision, you're going to push it to the right or you're going to push it to the left. You think, I'm in charge. I've got the steering wheel here. I'm going to decide, is it to the left or to the right? That decision, is it to the left or the right, was made up to 10 seconds, predicted by the people sitting at the back of the room before you reach that conscious decision. Um, yep. Well, it was presumably those brain areas. I mean, the decision was made in those brain areas. As you, I mean, decision, decision you usually associate with conscious subjective experience. Right. Yeah? And in that sense, the point is, insofar as there was a conscious decision, that wasn't what was having any effect on what went on. It was the brain firings that determined what happened, not the conscious decision. Uh, it would certainly be reflected in an EEG, but l let's just think. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, it would be reflected. <laughs> just the answer to the question is yes, it would be reflected in an EEG. You can be making a decision and then decide to stop yourself. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there's anything on parallel to this kind of timing on deciding to stop yourself, if you see what you need to uh, decide to stop an action once started. Yeah. Um, but it's very, very difficult to get this kind of set up in place in the first place. It, yeah. This is a much more fancier thing you're describing. Yeah. To, I'm always being surprised by what happens in current science, but to my knowledge, the, the, the fine-grained timing of that kind of corrective thing has not been explored. Yep. Intention can happen, but you can fail to do the action. So you sort of have yes. like pre no rather than pre yes. Yes, that's I, 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 no, th th that's certainly correct. Um, and when you think about it, with um, the way you start to get conscious of what you're doing is usually like you're tying your shoelaces, and then something goes wrong. You know, they're not tying properly, and you think, wait a minute, <laughs> that's when you back off. That's when an image of your action, a conscious image of your action, and the possibility for explicit reflection and control comes in. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, that picture is, is certainly Libet's own picture, I think, that um, you, you have a veto 
on what goes on. But usually you don't veto what goes on, if you see what I mean. Yeah? Life would be pretty much impossible if you, I mean, you couldn't drive if you're constantly thinking, I'm going to accelerate now. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you, you, you see what I mean? Uh, life requires, ordinary practical life requires seamless actions. Yep. Yes. 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 Well, I think in the libet that uh, in the original experiments, that's certainly a concern. Oh, where, where's it going? Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. As so often, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Um, I think in this initial experiment, with his hand is kind of whizzing round. Yeah. Um, uh, that's certainly a real concern. Um, but when it comes to a time period of 10 seconds, and you think about that scenario, where you're just thinking, well, shall I do it now? All right, I'll do it now. Yeah, it really seems like the temporal resolution there it can be pretty coarse, but it can still be quite clear that the brain signal was coming before the conscious decision. That, yeah? Um, So here's Patrick Haggard, uh, scientist Patrick Haggard. Um, yeah, well, as soon as I'll say, this prior activity, this prior brain activity, is not an unspecific preparation of a response. It's not that the back of the brain is just kind of gearing up and saying, okay, let's do something, and then the conscious decision takes over. It's that the, um, the activity is specifically coding, is it left or right? Um, I don't know where my Haggard quote's gone, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you what Haggard is saying in a second. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. here we are, here is Haggard. A general trend in the neuroscience of volition. This is what s many different results are pointing to. The idea that although we may experience that our conscious decisions and thoughts cause our actions, these experiences are in fact based on Redoubts, redoubts of activity in a network of brain areas that control voluntary action. So the general picture that is emerging is that there's a kind of ongoing um, cascade of neural activity heading towards the action, and that conscious intention comes somewhat along the way. So I suggested, blast it, um, I suggested that this is the natural reading and Patrick Haggard's remark there, conscious intention is a readout of all this neural activity. That, that suggested something like this, that all the cell firing, this cascade of cell firings is going on, generating the action, and you've got a readout of what's happening at some point, and you say, that's me doing it. I just made that conscious decision. Um, another way of thinking of it would be like this. You've got this cascade of uh, neural activity going on, and the conscious activity is actually a part of the thing that's happening. But still and all, the decision, right or left, I mean, what determined is going to be right or left, that happened way back here. And the conscious intention is coming late to the game. Yep. Yes. Um, th that I have no idea about. <laughs> I very much doubt. I, I, I mean, r pushing something to the left or the right, my impression is, I mean, as I say, I'm always surprised by how much is happening uh, in the labs around the world. But um, my impression is that pushing the thing to the left or the right is the state of the art. I mean, something fancier like um, deciding right after this class, I'm going to go for lunch or, or whatever, uh, or, or deciding to write something. These are th th these are harder to pinpoint, is my impression. Yeah, uh, harder to get harder to get the neural correlates of. Okay, so um, that seems to imply that. Uh, um, Huxley was completely correct. What we've got here is a complete vindication of Huxley. We think 
that our conscious life is affecting what goes on around us, but actually there is no evidence for that at all. All the evidence from the neuroscience is suggesting that your conscious decisions are not determining what you do. Fair enough? Yes? So wasn't that when you're sitting there and thinking about something? And yes. And like write it down? That's right. Well, actually, th th this goes back to the last c question, um, that what you would expect, I mean, what is predicted by these kind of findings is that deciding to write something down, that the conscious decision is going to um, come after the brain activity that determined exactly what you would write. Yeah? As I said, I don't think, I, I don't know of anything that does the work specifically on writing. But um, the prediction is if it works for to the right or to the left like that, then it's going to work like that for writing too. The brain activity determining exact from which someone sitting at the back of the room could determine exactly what you're going to write, that has happened before you made the conscious decision. I'm going to write that down. Uh -huh. you think about it for a while, have a collective thought, and then it's like somewhere else in your brain it starts reading the exact precise thoughts that are going to be what you need to get done the next time. That's right. Something else that your brain is doing that, yeah. Um, it feels like you're doing it, yeah? It feels like you're in complete charge of this, but that is an illusion. Maybe it's a necessary illusion. You know, maybe there are good reasons why we have this illusion of, being in charge, um, but it is an illusion. That's what these results seem to show. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, to me, that makes a lot of sense because you would think, like, when you're speaking, yeah, the word, the specific words that you're going to say, you yes. usually aren't thinking that you're going to be saying those things. They just kind of just come out. And Very good. Follow the general idea that you have. Yes. So that could be brain activity firing way in advance, saying that you're going to think this. That's very good. And notoriously, we're thinking, I mean, uh, your neighbor was asking about um, uh, correcting yourself. Notoriously, with speaking out loud and thinking about that, you can, correct, you can decide to correct yourself just too late, right? You say the thing and you think, oh my God, I w how, how, <laughs> how did I say that? I can't believe I just said that. You, you see what I mean? That monitoring may be happening too late. Um, so I agree with um, thinking the idea of a conscious decision to say whatever you're going to say, um, uh, being in charge of that, th th that's very unintuitive. But with something like flipping a lever to the right or to the left sometime in the next couple of minutes, that's a case where it really feels like you make the conscious decision. Like if I pick up the sheet of paper, yeah, um, and you decide whether to take it from me, yeah, you're your free choice. I'm going, to, uh, uh, I'm going to take it from you or not. You get a moment to think about it. Um, there it really feels like there is something going on in your mind prior to the action that made that action happen. Yeah. And that's what is turning out to be an illusion. Yeah. Yeah. The feeling of anticipation, yes, like, right. Even how, like, when you know you're going to do something, like, maybe they already made your decision, like, a minute ago, but then they just didn't know exactly when that would happen, like, yes. right or left. Yes. So you're like, okay, I'm going to go left then, but I'm yeah. still, like, I'll do that later. Yeah. But, but then, like, I don't know, maybe you just don't know. I, no, I, I agree. It's just based on the feeling, and it might affect how you act in some, in some Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there can be that thing where you say, look, sometime this morning I'm going to write to Jen. So you make that decision, yeah. and then a bit later, you think, oh, I better do that now. You, you, th th that's the kind of thing where there are lots of s aspects to whether to write, what to write, when exactly to do it, yeah, th 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 that can be decided at different points. But what I, what I find so um, arresting about this finding is that specific encoding, what they're specifically being asked about is, when did you consciously decide right or left? 
You know, the, it's that specific aspect of the action, the time of deciding right or left, of the decision that are being asked about, the time of deciding right or left. And the brain readouts are telling you right or left well in advance of that. Yeah. It's that specificity about this that is really so astonishing. Because I, I agree that it's kind of common sense what you say, that all these different aspects to the action can be planned at different times. I've got to write to Jane, oh God, what am I going to say? Oh, I better do it now. You, you know, these, these, these are all staged. I mean, they, they happen at different stages. But this is not like that. Yeah, this has been set up so as to avoid that kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah? So in the clicker example, if you gave me a clicker and told me to push it whenever, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do it at 47 seconds. But so you could look at that even before I get to 47 saying that she, that's, she's made the decision to do that before. Yes, the, uh, the, that's a good example, but that, that wasn't the structure. It, it wasn't that I do the action at 27 seconds. Mm -hmm. It was um, make the free decision, just do it now. You see what I mean? And note when you made the decision. So the action might come a bit later. Yeah, you know, might if you're you know slow and clumsy, <laughs> it might take you a while to get your hand down to push the clicker. Um, but you were not what you were noting was the time the you were noting where the hand of the clock was when you thought, what the hell I'll do it now, uh -huh. before your hand lumbered into action. I don't mean your hand, but I mean one, <laughs> before one's hand lumbered into action. Yeah. So that, what you're describing is fair enough, but that would be a different situation. Mm -hmm. What Libet was asking about was the situation where you just think the thought, just make the decision, do it now, and note when you did that, when you made that decision. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the thing that the uh, uh, cells and premotor cortex are firing up before you made that conscious decision. But in my example, wouldn't they be firing up before I decided that I was going to push it at 47 seconds? You're trying to describe an example where there isn't that moment of truth when you make yeah. the conscious decision. Well, there's still the, I'm going to do it, then, yeah. then it's just not right now. That's right. That, that, that's just a different example. Uh, yeah. The, 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 um, but the prediction would be that the cell firings are happening before the conscious decision even then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that's not what Libet's thing was testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are we happy with that? I don't know why I'm asking you. I mean, <laughs> it's, not <a> matter, <laughs> it's not a matter of what goes on in your conscious life after all. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, does that make sense? Does that all make perfect sense? Okay. So the next question is, um, if that's all right, is there any sense in which we are free? I mean, ordinary human life is built around notions of freedom and responsibility. Yeah, there are some things you freely choose to do and you make them happen. I mean, um, if, we're, if you and I are in an elevator and you stand on my toe, then um, it makes a, such a lot of difference if I think, oh, you were pushed, uh, the, uh, you, you, you accidentally got onto my toe, than if you saw my toe <laughs> juicily there and thought, boy, look at that, how vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, I mean... That, that makes a big difference to my reaction to you socially. Um, whether I think you did this because of a free decision, look at that toe, um, or, or if I think it was just you were pushed. But what um, this seems to be telling you is that that really basic kind of distinction doesn't exist. It's always a matter of being pushed around. I mean, Huxley says um, the frog's free in that there's nothing to prevent it doing what it desires to do. Um, you know, that's right that the frog is not bound and gagged, right? I mean, nobody is picking up the frog and pushing it about. Um, that's not what's going on. And Huxley says, well, there you are. That's freedom. What do you want? Freedom is literally freedom from chains, right? The frog is not in chains, so it's free. But it's not much Freedom, it seems to me, that that gives you. The thing is that there's nothing physically obstructing it from doing what it wants, but its desires aren't connected to anything. Its desires aren't making anything happen. 
I suppose you have a child that you just for the purposes of experiment wired up so that it's completely under the control of someone with a joystick, right? The child's limbs move at your control, right? You, you've really got this child um, wired so you can make it move exactly how you want it to. Suppose that's what's happening. Um, well, is that child free? Well, suppose that what goes on is that, I mean, we all confabulate a bit, right? You know, you drop something and you say, oh, I meant to drop that. Ch actually, th that's one basic finding about children that I, I, I heard a while ago, that children le start lying almost as soon as they can talk. <laughs> um, and the real surprise, though, is what they lie about. Many of their lies are really to preserve their dignity, as in, I wanted that to happen. You know, or I meant to drop that, or I meant to walk into that wall, or whatever. Yeah? So, the, and we all know that, right? You can fabulate things, you make things up um, when you don't really quite know what's going on. So, suppose that what's going on is you have a child that is completely under the control of someone with a joystick, its limbs are made to move however the person with the joystick wants. But however its limbs move, the child says, oh, I wanted to pick that up. I wanted to walk over there. I wanted to trip over here, right? Well, is the child free in that situation? If it just conforms its desires to whatever it's being made to do and says, yes, you know, it's, it's, it's got a kind of um, zen approach to the thing where it, it, rather than going through this disagreeable business of trying to make its, uh, the world conform to its desires, it has its desires conform to whatever it's actually doing. You see what I mean? Yeah? Is that an example of the child being free and in charge and responsible for what's happening? If that child stands on your toe, are you going to say, ah, well, you wanted that to happen? Because after all, what happens is the guy with the joystick gets the child to stand on your toe, and uh, then the child says, yes, I wanted that to happen. And you say, you scoundrel, you rogue, you rascal, right? Is that a fair reaction to that situation? Um, yes? Sorry. Um, this is kind of a little bit separate, but in things like determining, why is, why is it that every time there's a, a, like, every time a decision-making choice comes up, that there's like space of hesitation? Like if it's determined- There's a space of hesitation, why, yeah. Why isn't it that it like happens instantaneously? And like, I guess more importantly, why is it that we like feel that we're expending effort to make decisions? Well, if you elaborate this picture here, um, suppose you have this picture here where a conscious intention is just a kind of readout coming after the neural activity, yeah? Um, there might, after all, be glitches in the neural activity here. There, I mean, any, any account of the neural activity is going to have some kind of error correction or error anticipation built into it. So um, if there's later some error correction going on here, then at the level of the conscious life, you will get a readout of that too. And you'll say, oh, yeah, no, that was, that was a bad idea. Yeah, we'll feel like you're thinking that was a bad idea. But that's not to say that feeling like I was thinking that's a bad idea, that isn't what made me stop. What made me stop was the stuff going on down here at the brain level. So, if, so for example, like if you see a bear in the woods, and it's like totally distant that you run away, right? Or like, I don't let you hesitate and evaluate and assess like all Fair enough, things. yes, yes. Right, so you see the bear, you run, exactly. yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's an, it's an interesting question, but the line of reasoning suggested, I mean, we're, we are only talking here about experiments involving one-off decisions um, to do this or that, yeah. Um, I'm not something like torturing for weeks over what SE I'm going to do, yeah. Uh, uh, 
But the basic picture would be that the neural firings down here are what are making everything happen, and that the consciousness is just this readout you're getting of what's going on at the level of neural activity. Now, the thing is, the neural stuff down here could be taking a very long time. I mean, if you're, when you're deciding what SE to do, uh, there is going to be, I mean, your brain is at work, right? The, the, I mean, the, the, there just are uh, uh, cell assemblies involved in deciding what um, SE to write. And it's their work that is determining where your hand moves in the end to write one essay rather than another. Yeah? Um, so it's not as if the, the brain activity is always instantaneous. The brain activity could take a very long time, and your readouts will be coming over a similarly long time. Yeah? Yeah, Yeah, that's, that, that's exactly what, we're uh, what I'm trying to, starting to address now. So if the mechanical park is doing all the work, what does that tell you about free will? Yeah, that's the question. And um, Huxley has got this very cheerful attitude. If you're not actually in chains, then you have freedom of will, because nothing is physically stopping you doing what you want to do. But this is what I mean about the child. If the child is conforming its desires to what its body is doing anyway, then I don't see that the child is free. Um, the child is not in chains. If the child says, I didn't want that to happen, it is not being physically restrained. Um, but um, uh, the child, it seems to me intuitively, the child is not in charge. Its desires are tracking what's going on physically. Yeah? Now, the thing is that, um, that the child's desires are all being formed after the fact. All the child's desires are confabulations. They're, you do the thing, and then you rationalize, and you say, oh, no, why did I want to do that? Of course, I wanted to do it because of this. And you tell yourself a story about why you did that. If I pick up the paper, I wave it about, I say, hey, I'm I've got the paper up, I'm waving it about. Now, why would I have wanted to do that? Of course, I wanted to make some point, <laughs> right? Um, or, yeah, whatever, I was hot, <laughs> right? Um, now, th there are plenty of cases like that where it's, I mean, people put their, you put your hand on a hot radiator and you jerk it away, yeah? And someone says, why did you do that? I did that all oh, because it hurt, because it was painful. Um, but actually, when you time people moving their hand away from a hot radiator, they do it very, very fast. They do it faster than it could take for signals to travel up to the brain and then back generate pain and then back down to move the hand. Yeah, The movement of the hand is coming very, very fast. But what happens is people say, people jerk their hand back and they say, oh, that really hurt. That was really hot. That's why I did it. So, your body does the thing, and then you tell yourself a story as to why you wanted that to happen, how what was going on in your subjective life was really the key thing. But there, there are just more and more cases where you can see quite clearly that is not what was going on. Yep. Exactly, exactly. If you remember that, that example to, to clean up, I, I chose the um, shovel to clean up the chicken coop. Yeah, yeah, you remember that case? That's exactly that kind of confabulation. And it's not um, a deliberate attempt to, to deceive that kind of thing. It's that you're doing your best to make sense of what is going on. Yeah? Um, and that is what is going on in ordinary so-called free action. You're t that's what's going on with this child I was describing, that is doing his best to make sense of what is going on. It doesn't occur to it that some individual has got it wired up to a computer and is controlling it. Yeah? So it says, well, the best sense I can make of all this is I wanted this to happen. And the Libet picture is that's what goes on in everyday life. That's what we all do the whole time. That's what life is that constant confabulation, that illusion of free will. Um, I once was giving a talk to a psychology department, and um, I said laughingly, um, but of course, if you thought that, 
then you'd have to think that all our ordinary desires and how we felt about what we were doing, you would have to think that, that that was all just confabulation. And I looked out at the people and their faces were stony. That was what they all thought. I mean, the pe uh, people just take it for granted that this is what experimental psychology has demonstrated. Right? So th 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 this is not just one or two striking experiments. This is a whole body of work going on here. Yeah. The thing is, and, and yeah. Okay. I, I thought, yeah, yeah. So don't reflexes kind of show that you don't have, uh, that we don't have control over the reflexes? That's right. The interesting thing about the reflexes, of course, we don't always have control over what our body does, and you know, we know we, you, everybody knows that anyhow. But what is striking about these cases, like the radiator, is that um, you think you were in control. You think your conscious life was involved in a way in which you look at it objectively, it quite clearly wasn't. Yeah. Um, it, the, the key thing is that in that kind of case, you confabulate. You tell yourself this story that really hurt, that felt really hot. Yeah. And the diagnosis is that's the general story. So it seems to me that in the case of the child, if that's what's going on, you don't actually have any real freedom. I think if you knew what that, that that was what was happening when the child stood on your toe, and then to say you rascal and go after the child would be unfair. It wasn't a result of free agency on the part of the child. But what the psychology seems to be telling you is that that is the general fact for all of us in ordinary adult life. You might say, well, look, I know that it's not like that in an ordinary adult life because if I'd wanted something different, something different would have happened, right? Surely that makes sense. Um, and you might say, look, that's all freedom is, that my actions are responsive to my conscious intentions in this sense. If I want it, it happens. If I didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened, right? What more do you want than that? But the thing is, that really is not enough. I mean, remember this picture. There are these cell firings causing your action, and a conscious intention <coughs> is the readout. Now, if you'd had a different conscious intention, then something different would have happened. But that's because the only way you've had a, you'd have had a different conscious intention would have been if those cell firings were different. And if those cell firings were different, then you've had a different action. But what you want is for your conscious intention to be affecting the action directly. The situation is kind of like a barometer and a storm. Suppose you're watching the needle on a barometer over a while, and you say, look at that. Whenever it points to stormy, by God, there's a storm. What's going on? Is that thing controlling what happens? Um, well, uh, it's true that if the needle hadn't pointed to stormy, there wouldn't have been a storm. But that's because if the needle hadn't pointed to stormy, that could only have been because the atmospheric pressure was different. And if the atmospheric pressure had been different, there wouldn't have been a storm. But that doesn't show that the needle is causing the storm. And you can show that by just reaching in and grasping the pointer and switching it round. That doesn't make any difference to whether there's a storm when you do that. But it's still true that ordinarily, if it hadn't been, if it, so your conscious intentions here are like the pointer on the barometer. They're good indicators as to what's going to happen, but that's not because they are making it happen. What's making it happen are those background cell firings. Yeah. You do, just as with the barometer, you really might make a mistake. You really might think, God, that thing controls the weather. Wouldn't it be great to, to be in charge of that? But that is just a mistake. It's a reader of what's going to happen. So similarly with your conscious intentions, you think, by God, they're controlling my actions. What I decide, look, I want to pick my arm up. Whoa, there we go, look. <laughs> I, my conscious intention just made my arm go up. But that is just a mistake. So you could say if I'd wanted something different, something different would have happened. But if you'd wanted something different, that would have been because the earlier cell firings were different. And then you would indeed have acted differently. But that's not showing that your conscious intention was the cause of the action. 
And actually, it's so pretty disturbing. Even if you think about this picture, um, where you've got the, all the background cell firings, and then the conscious intention is generated as a kind of way station, if you think of it like that, then the conscious intention will still be one of the causes of the action. But the trouble is, it won't be the conscious intention that's determining which way your action goes to the right or the left, to right this or that. That was all determined much earlier. And the conscious intention is just something that happens along the way. I mean, you te one tends to assume that if I just sit here in, in um, splendid isolation, and then I decide out of nowhere, I'm going to pick the pen up, or I'm going to write a novel, or um, I'm going to write to Jane, or whatever, then my conscious intention sparked out of nowhere and generated the thing. My conscious intention was what started it to happen that I wrote this rather than that. But on this picture, that's not what's going on at all. The cell firings are specifically encoding what you're going to do. And your conscious intention comes up later. So that picture already shows in that it's not enough for freedom that your conscious intentions should be causing your actions. Um, your conscious intentions might be causing your actions, but if they're merely the product of some earlier non-conscious process that determined what you were going to do, then you're still not in charge of what's happening. Yep. So why is it necessary that the, the, the concept of you or I just be our, our consciousness? Why can't it also include the other parts of my brain that are fired? Because I, right. I consider those part of me, and if they have desires, and then my conscious mind reflects that, I'm okay with them having that brain. Yeah. The, uh, on this picture, they don't have desires. Yeah, they're, they're just dumb cell firings. Yeah. But they're what's making everything happen. It, the, the way you put it, they have desires. That, may, that, that, that fits with what I was saying about um, the guy with the joystick in charge of the child. Yeah, like there's somebody else here. There's your brain that's driving you about. Yeah, it has its wants, it has its agenda. And you're having to just fall in with it. Um, but... Uh, I think the, bit, the, the, the picture that um, some scientists have at any rate is that this stuff down here, the cell firings, that's not a matter of desires or a subjective life at all. Um, that is just patterns of cell firing. And then the conscious decisions and anything you want to talk about in those terms, that comes later. You see what I mean? If you're characterizing this, um, how should I say, in the, uh, uh, getting a strict and literal truth, You'd just be talking about patterns of cell firing, electrical activity. You wouldn't be talking about beliefs and wants and desires. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask, but I, I still believe there is some kind of uh, uh, power that our conscious has over our body. Because, for example, if I'm riding a bicycle and my job is to steer from your direction, and you tell me, uh, go right, and uh, is, it, is it definitely that I first perceive this signal, go right, and yes. I decided to turn right. It feels like that, doesn't it? But um, uh, look, if you just think about the um, um, what has to be going on here, suppose you think of it in terms of, blast it. Suppose you think of it in terms of this picture, yeah? Um, when you hear from me, go right, if, you're, if that's what's happening, yeah, um, then that's uh, got an impact on your brain. So you hear go right, your brain does its stuff, and you switch the handlebars to the left, I mean to the right, <laughs> right? Um, um, uh, so you're now going right, and a split second later you say to yourself, oh yeah, he said go right. That's why he's going, that's why I'm going right, because I heard him say that, yeah? But your subjective life is coming along after the fact. Your subjective life is just confabulating this I'm in charge story. You just heard go right, and it's like the hand in the radiator. You heard go right, and your brain did this thing go right. A moment later, up in your conscious life, you said, oh, yeah, he said go right. Yeah, that's why I'm going right. If we did a very precise timing of it, um, you'd see that that was what was happening. That's a prediction. Yeah. 
think it's definitely part of what we call being conscious or how, I mean, how do you define this being con- what is being conscious? Getting the signal is definitely part of being conscious. That's, that's what comes first. No, getting the signal is not necessarily part of being conscious. Your brain gets signals the whole time that are not necessarily conscious. Uh, Jackson in the here. Yes. Um, uh, there will be one sort of story about how this process has led to that. Yeah. And there will be a different story for whenever there's this what we call top down process that. Yes. Uh, Very different good. Yeah. There's sort of cells firing into different cells. Yep. Uh, exactly. The, Anyone, ha- you, you, you've got to be right. There's got to be a difference between top-down processing and bottom-up processing. There, I mean, well, let, let me just check I'm getting you. It, 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 there's got to be a distinction between a simple reflex action, yeah, and um, something like uh, going to a restaurant where um, you, you've learned patiently all that you have to negotiate in going to a restaurant, what you do with a snooty waiter, you know, how you, how you handle a terrible meal. You, uh, uh, you've learned all that stuff. So it's by no means that you're just push, picking your hand off the radiator. You've got this whole background history uh, of, of, of stuff to negotiate. Is, is that the kind of thing you mean by, by top down? Uh, let, let, let's just call them Tehane and Akash <laughs> to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to give them a name, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, no, that, that, that's really good. Um, um, so you might say, if I've got control processes in charge here, that's, that's the conscious life. But um, if you think about pushing it to the left or to the right, is that a control process? I mean, that seems like a control process. And certainly it should be on Tehane and Akash's account because consciousness is implicated. Um, but if, but the same point is true. I mean, it, the, 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 I, I hadn't thought of uh, Tehen and Akash in this context, but of course it applies directly to the um, uh, to those um, uh, 2008 uh, findings that, that, that I was showing. That that move to the right or to the left is going to be a control process in Tehen and Akash's uh, picture. Um, but um, the conscious experience is still coming. 10 seconds after um, the specific right or left has been encoded. Uh, so what does that tell you? It tells you that either you've got to, either the global workspace is cu- stuff is coming in after um, uh, all the work has been done to encode right or left, or else it tells you that the global workspace is um, leading consciousness and consciousness is coming after the global watch space has done its thing. Yeah. But it's a really interesting exercise to think. Maybe we should set that as an essay question. <laughs> How to interpret the Levet finding, I mean the, the 2000, those 2008 findings in terms of Tehen and Akash. I, I don't think we'll do that as an essay, but <laughs> that's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, you, you had a question. Yeah. Yes, right. That's right. Th- that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, that w- w- when I when I say right, well, perceive that uh, there's got to be something going on in my ear, right? There's got to be something going on in my auditory cortex w- when um, when the sound waves hit my ear. Yeah, that's what I, uh, I didn't mean by perceive at first. More than that, they've got to be causally responsive to what's going on. These cells have got to be reacting to the sound when I say right. But carry on. Oh, I, th- I just thought when you said, when you say right, I always seem intuitive to me that it's going to see something else before it loses itself by it. May, may it be like a consciousness or something else, but I feel like there's, when you like give a command, it goes yes. through some process first and then it goes. That is really an interesting take, but l- l- let me play that back to you. Is what you're saying, it feels like when you hear somebody saying right, um, that goes to the conscious mind, 
and then it gets to the brain. So, but not a brain system. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it, you might be right, but it's a really radical idea that, yeah, I mean, uh, anyone working on hearing has got this picture where you've got the inner ear, you've got all this stuff um, uh, connecting up to these nerve systems, and that if you're asking what's the causation here, when you hear the word right, it starts out with all these processes, um, I mean, you can just track it from the ear back into the brain. Uh, yeah? Okay, so uh, that would be a radically different picture. Okay, qu quickly, yeah, one, two. Yeah. What do you think that language is a um, Yeah, I'm suggesting that in, the, uh, what I was suggesting was that it's like the radiator case. Okay. You hear right, you turn to the right, and then you say, oh, I heard that turn to the right, yeah. So. It, it, language shows up in consciousness eventually, but after all the work has been done. For the beats of creativity. Sorry? No, the beats of things would be true, wouldn't it be um, you hear the cells hear it first, then you think, um, I'm going to turn right, and then you turn right? So I mean, you're already, gonna, you're already in, like, in the process of... That's right, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 that's so exactly not, the, the oh, picture. Right, that yeah. it comes in a little before then. So you could say, no, I'm not going to... That's right. That's uh, th that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, do we call everything going on in our brain that we subconscious subconscious? Uh, I don't see why not. Yes. Uh, I mean. We could just say the subconscious does. Ah. <laughs> well. Uh, yeah. Um. You can use subconscious like that, I, 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 but it's got nothing to do with Freud's subconscious in that sense. I mean, what's going to be subconscious in that sense is going to be stuff like um, uh, the ratios of uh, light of different wavelengths being reflected from different parts of the room. Right? That's not part of the Freudian subconscious. That's something that your visual system uses that you didn't know about, that a vision scientist tells you, hey, that's what your visual system is doing. It's sampling light of different wavelengths from different ratios of light reflectances from different parts of the room. But, um, uh, okay, you can call that subconscious if you like, but just don't run away with the idea that this is some deep psychoanalysis. I mean, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so do we have freedom at, at this point? If this picture is right, if I've explained it correctly, I mean, what is your feeling? Can you put your hand up if your feeling is, yes, if, just say, if this picture is right, then we are free, we are in charge of what we're doing, it is up to us what we do. Can you put your hand up if you think that's correct on this picture? H higher. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's being very shy. <laughs> Sorry? Um, well, I'd be setting this picture on which your conscious life is tracking along behind the cell firings that are specifically determined, that are determining specifically what happens. Yeah? And say, suppose that's a general picture. Yeah? That's to say, suppose epiphenomenalism is true. Your conscious life makes no difference to anything. <laughs> if that's right, are you in charge of what's happening? Yes? Put up your hand if the answer is yes. You're still in charge. Okay, um, put up your hand if you think the answer is no, you're not in charge if that picture is right. Okay, so I, I would say that's about two to one, so uh, 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 against, so significant but not, by no means overwhelming. Okay, what about this picture on which your conscious life tracks behind the specific determinants of what you do? Can you put your hand up if you think that's persuasive? Yes, I believe that. Uh, the picture where your conscious life is coming afterwards? Is that a question or a hand? Uh, that's a vote, okay. I have a question. Yeah, uh, are you asking whether we, this is to me, are you asking whether we uh, agree with the idea that consciousness follows in the cell firing thing, like that little flow chart? Yes. Or, or, that's, what you're asking. that's what I'm asking. Okay, so I is epiphenomenalism true? Is that picture of the monkey on top of the tiger facing in the wrong direction with a wheel not connected to anything? Is that correct? I mean, can you put your hand up if you think the answer is yes? 
Okay. <laughs> okay, and if you think the answer is no, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, and if you just don't know, if you understand the question perfectly well, but you just don't know, okay. Okay, that's fair enough. That's, that's very interesting. <laughs> okay. So, yep. Yeah. There's the voice of reason and reconciliation. Ten <laughs> yeah, percent. Like yeah, Consciousness comes later, yeah. That's right, yeah. Oh, well, how, how do we the, no, the EEG is happening before, the EEG readings are happening before the conscious decision. Before the conscious yeah, the, EEG, e, the EEG readings are reporting cell activity happening before the conscious decision. You know about the time of the conscious decision because of the subject's report. Yeah, the subject tells you where was the hand in the clock when you made that decision. And the EEG is telling you those cell firings were happening before that conscious decision. Should only happen to people at the time of phenomenon? Uh, that's what I've been suggesting. And in the review sessions, we can come back to this. Because, frankly, if we have to agree with this, then civilization is at an end. <laughs> I mean, that thing I said about um, someone steps in your toe, Right, that's like a straw in the wind, but that's the general situation of everyday social life, or the court, the law courts, or um, just anything that goes on. You think it makes such a big difference? Was this the result, the consequence of what someone wanted, or did it just happen? Yeah, we think that's a really big decision, and civilization really depends on that distinction. So it is really a huge thing if this is correct. Yeah. Um, so on the one hand, the experimental arguments are very powerful. On the other hand, the conclusion is um, cataclysmic. <laughs> uh, one, two. Yeah. So if this were correct, couldn't we just, couldn't, so wouldn't nobody think about the reaction? That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. I mean, in a way, this happens all the time anyway in the law courts. That um, I, I once talked to a uh, a police officer who was extremely sore about this. Um, this is a young guy who just had his first few appearances in court, and he said, every time I've got someone, some damn social psychologist bobs up and says, well, his background made him do it, or his brain made him do it. <laughs> and, and he says, my attitude is, you did that, you're nicked. Um, <laughs> but that's not the way it works. You know, we just accept that if someone's got a brain tumor or something, and that is causing aberrations in their behavior, that is really an excuse. You know, that, that, that really lets you off. But if this kind of picture is right, then that kind of case could be made overwhelmingly. Yeah, yeah I mean, across the board. Yeah. yeah. Uh, last one, and then we've got to stop. I, I'm still inclined to believe that there's a conscious intervention. Yes. Um, when, when a subject is saying something like, uh, to you, like, what left to the right, or what left to the right, or what left to the right, because otherwise, what, like you said, there was just a delay, or like, it yeah. took a long Right. The, the cells firing and then the actual action being perpetrated by executing. Um, but why why should there be any like why should it be any lengthier to decide what left stands in the right versus like deciding to run away from the jail and something like that? There's still a culmination of like external effects and internal process yeah. like in both scenarios. So why is it that one has yes. such a like long delay, not just a delay but like an active effort in deciding yeah. 
it's a, okay, it's an interesting idea that, and I hadn't thought of it before, that um, why does it take so long if it's not conscious? But, uh, okay, the, 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 I, I would just like to reflect on that. I mean, all, all my first thought is some physical processes just do take a long time, yeah? And the biology here might be one of them. But it's an interesting question. Okay, we have to stop. We're out, we're out of time. But I hope we can come back to this in review sessions. Okay.